Dive with us into the fascinating world of biographies, histories, and speeches as we learn from the words of the past. Chapter 1 of Kept for the Master's Use This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Fiddlesticks Kept for the Master's Use by Francis Ridley Havergal Chapter 1 our lives kept for jesus keep my life that it may be consecrated lord to thee many a heart has echoed the little song take my life and let it be consecrated lord to thee and yet those echoes have not been in every case and at all times so clear and full and firm so continuously glad as we would wish and perhaps expected some of us have said I launch me forth upon a sea of boundless love and tenderness, and after a little we have found, or fancied, that there is a hidden leak in our bark, and though we are doubtless still afloat, yet we are not sailing with the same free, exultant confidence as at first. What is it that has dulled and weakened the echo of our consecration song? What is the little leak that hinders the swift and buoyant course of our consecrated life? Holy Father, let thy loving spirit guide the hand that writes and strengthen the heart of every one who reads what shall be written for Jesus' sake. While well, many a sorrowfully varied answer to these questions may and probably will arise from touched and sensitive consciences, each being shown by God's faithful spirit the special sin, the special yielding to temptation which has hindered and spoiled the blessed life which they sought to enter and enjoy, it seems to me that one or other of two things has lain at the outset of the failure and disappointment. First, it may have arisen from want of the simplest belief in the simplest fact, as well as want of trust in one of the simplest and plainest words our gracious Master ever uttered, the unbelief fact being simply that He hears us the untrusted word being one of those plain, broad foundation stones on which we rested our whole weight. It may be many years ago, and which we had no idea we ever doubted, or were in any danger of doubting now. Him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. Take my life. We have said it or sung it before the Lord. It may be many times, but if it were only once whispered in his ear with full purpose of heart, should we not believe that he heard it? And if we know that he heard it, should we not believe that he has answered it, and fulfilled this our heart's desire? For with him hearing means heeding. Then why should we doubt that he did verily take our lives when we offered them, our bodies when we presented them? Have we not been wronging his faithfulness all the time by practically, even if unconsciously, doubting whether the prayer ever really reached him? And if so, is it any wonder that we have not realized all the power and joy of full consecration? By some means or other he has to teach us to trust implicitly at every step of the way, and so, if we did not really trust in this matter, he has had to let us find out our want of trust by withholding the sensible part of the blessing, and thus stirring us up to find out why it is withheld. An offered gift must be either accepted or refused. Can he have refused it when he has said, Him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out? If not, then it must have been accepted, it is just the same process as when we came to him, first of all, with the intolerable burden of our sins. There was no help for it but to come with them to him, and take his word for it that he would not and did not cast us out. And so coming, so believing, we found rest to our souls. We found that his word was true, and that his taking away our sins was a reality. Some give their lives to him then and there, and go forth to live thenceforth, not at all unto themselves, but unto him who died for them. This is as it should be, for conversion and consecration ought to be simultaneous. But practically it is not very often so, except with those in whom the bringing out of darkness into marvelous light has been sudden and dazzling and full of deepest contrasts. More frequently the work resembles the case of the Hebrew servant described in Exodus 21, 
who after six years experience of a good master's service dedicates himself voluntarily unreservedly and irrevocably to it saying i love my master i will not go out free the master then accepting and sealing him to a lifelong service free in law yet bound in love this seems to be a figure of later consecration founded on experience and love and yet as at our first coming it is less than nothing worse than nothing that we have to bring for our lives even our redeemed and pardoned lives are not only weak and worthless but defiled and sinful but thanks be to god for the altar that sanctifieth the gift even our lord jesus christ himself by him we draw nigh unto god to him as one with the father we offer our living sacrifice in him as the beloved of the father we know it is accepted so dear friends when once he has wrought in us the desire to be altogether his own and put into our hearts the prayer take my life let us go on our way rejoicing believing that he has taken our lives our hands our feet our voices our intellects our whole selves to be ever only all for him let us consider that a blessedly settled thing not because of anything we have felt or said or done but because we know that he heareth us and because we know that he is true to his word suppose our hearts do not condemn us in this matter our disappointment may arise from another cause it may be that we have not received because we have not asked a fuller and further blessing suppose that we did believe thankfully and surely that the lord heard our prayer and that he did indeed answer and accept us and set us apart for himself and yet we find that our consecration was not merely miserably incomplete but that we have drifted back again almost to where we were before or suppose things are not quite so bad as that still we have not quite all we expected and even if we think we can truly say o oh god my heart is fixed we find that to our daily sorrow somehow or other the details of our conduct do not seem to be fixed something or other is perpetually slipping through till we get perplexed and distressed then we are tempted to wonder whether after all there was not some mistake about it and the lord did not really take us at our word although we took him at his word and then the struggle with one doubt and entanglement and temptation only seems to land us in another what is to be done then first i think very humbly and utterly honestly to search and try our ways before our god or rather as we shall soon realize our helplessness to make such a search ask him to do it for us praying for his promised spirit to show us unmistakably if there is any secret thing with us that is hindering both the inflow and outflow of his grace to us and through us do not let us shrink from some unexpected flash into a dark corner do not let us wince at the sudden touching of a hidden plague spot the lord always does his own work thoroughly if we will only let him do it if we put our case into his hands he will search and probe fully and firmly though very tenderly very painfully it may be but only that he may do the very thing we want cleanse us and heal us thoroughly so that we may set off to walk in real newness of life but if we do not put it unreservedly into his hands it will be no use thinking or talking about our lives being consecrated to him the heart that is not entrusted to him for searching will not be undertaken by him for cleansing the life that fears to come to the light lest any deed should be reproved can never know the blessedness and the privileges of walking in the light but what then when he has graciously again put a new song in our mouth and we are singing ransomed healed restored forgiven who like me his praise should sing and again with fresh earnestness we are saying take my life and let it be consecrated lord to thee are we only to look forward to the same disappointing experience over again are we always to stand at the threshold consecration is not so much a step as a course 
not so much an act as a position to which a course of action inseparably belongs in so far as it is a course and a position there must naturally be a definite entrance upon it and a time it may be a moment when that entrance is made that is when we say take but we do not want to go on taking a first step over and over again what we want now is to be maintained in that position and to fulfill that course so let us go on to another prayer having already said take my life for i cannot give it to thee let us now say with deepened conviction that without christ we really can do nothing keep my life for i cannot keep it for thee let us ask this with the same simple trust to which in so many other things he has so liberally and graciously responded for this is the confidence that we have in him that if we ask anything according to his will he heareth us and if we know that he hears us whatsoever we ask we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him there can be no doubt that this petition is according to his will because it is based upon many a promise may i give it to you just as it floats through my own mind again and again knowing whom i have believed and being persuaded that he is able to keep that which i have committed unto him keep my life that it may be consecrated lord to thee keep my moments and my days let them flow in ceaseless praise keep my hands that they may move at the impulse of thy love keep my feet that they may be swift and beautiful for thee keep my voice that i may sing always only for my king keep my lips that they may be filled with messages from thee keep my silver and my gold not a mite would i withhold keep my intellect and use every power as thou shalt choose keep my will o oh, keep it thine for it is no longer mine keep my heart it is thine own it is now thy royal throne keep my love my lord i pour at thy feet its treasure store keep myself that i may be ever only all for thee yes he who is able and willing to take unto himself is no less able and willing to keep for himself our willing offering has been made by his enabling grace and this our king has seen with joy and now we pray keep this for ever in the imagination of the thoughts of the heart of thy people first chronicles twenty nine seventeen and eighteen this blessed taking once for all which we may quietly believe as an accomplished fact followed by the continual keeping 
for which he will be continually inquired of by us seems analogous to the great washing by which we have part in christ and the repeated washing of the feet for which we need to be continually coming to him for with the deepest and sweetest consciousness that he has indeed taken our lives to be his very own the need of his active and actual keeping of them in every detail and at every moment is most fully realized but then we have the promise of our faithful god i the lord do keep it i will keep it night and day the only question is will we trust this promise or will we not if we do we shall find it come true if not of course it will not be realized for unclaimed promises are like uncashed checks they will keep us from bankruptcy but not from want but if not why not what right have we to pick out one of his faithful sayings and say we don't expect him to fulfill that what defense can we bring what excuse can we invent for so doing if you appeal to experience against his faithfulness to his word i will appeal to experience too and ask you did you ever really trust jesus to fulfill any word of his to you and find your trust deceived as to the past experience of the details of your life not being kept for jesus look a little more closely at it and you will find that though you may have asked you did not trust whatever you did really trust him to keep he has kept and the unkept things were never really entrusted scrutinize this past experience as you will and it will only bear witness against your unfaithfulness never against his absolute faithfulness yet this witness must not be unheeded we must not forget the things that are behind till they are confessed and forgiven let us now bring all this unsatisfactory past experience and most of all the want of trust which has been the poison spring of its course to the precious blood of christ which cleanseth us even us from all sin even this sin perhaps we never saw that we were not trusting jesus as he deserves to be trusted if so let us wonderingly hate ourselves the more that we could be so trustless to such a saviour and so sinfully dark and stupid that we did not even see it and oh let us wonderingly love him the more that he has been so patient and gentle with us upbraiding not though in our slow-hearted foolishness we have been grieving him by this subtle unbelief and then by his grace may we enter upon a new era of experience our lives kept for him more fully than ever before because we trust him more simply and unreservedly to keep them here we must face a question and perhaps a difficulty does it not almost seem as if we were at this point led to trusting to our trust making everything hinge upon it and thereby only removing a subtle dependence upon ourselves one step further back disguising instead of renouncing it if christ's keeping depends upon our trusting and our continuing to trust depends upon ourselves we are in no better or safer position than before and shall only be landed in a fresh series of disappointments the old story something for the sinner to do crops up again here only with the ground shifted from works to trust said a friend to me i see now i did trust jesus to do everything else for me but i thought that this trusting was something that i had got to do and so of course what she had got to do had been a perpetual effort and frequent failure we can no more trust and keep on trusting than we can do anything else of ourselves even in this it must be jesus only we are not to look to him only to be the author and finisher of our faith but we are to look to him for all the intermediate fulfillment of the work of faith second thessalonians one eleven we must ask him to go on fulfilling it in us committing even this to his power 
for we both may and must commit our very faith to him and trust to him our trust what a long time it takes us to come down to the conviction and still more to the realization of the fact that without him we can do nothing but that he must work all our works in us this is the work of god that ye believe in him whom he has sent and no less must it be the work of god that we go on believing and that we go on trusting then dear friends who are longing to trust him with unbroken and unwavering trust cease the effort and drop the burden and now entrust your trust to him he is just as well able to keep that of any other part of the complex lives which we want him to take and keep for himself and oh do not pass on content with the thought yes that is a good idea perhaps i should find that a great help but now then do it it is no help to the sailor to see a flash of light across a dark sea if he does not instantly steer accordingly consecration is not a religiously selfish thing if it sinks into that it ceases to be consecration we want our lives kept not that we may feel happy and be saved the distress consequent on wandering and get the power with god and man and all the other privileges linked with that we shall have all this because the lower is included in the higher but our true aim if the love of christ constraineth us will be far beyond this not for me at all but for jesus not for my safety but for his glory not for my comfort but for his joy not that i may find rest but that he may see the travail of his soul and be satisfied yes for him i want to be kept kept for his sake kept for his use kept for his witness kept for his joy kept for him that in me he may show forth some tiny sparkle of his light and beauty kept to do his will and his work in his own way kept it may be to suffer for his sake kept for him that he may do just what seemeth him good with me kept so that no other lord shall have any more dominion over me but that jesus shall have all there is to have little enough indeed but not divided or diminished by any other claim is not this o you who love the lord is not this worth living for worth asking for worth trusting for this is consecration and i cannot tell you the blessedness of it it is not the least use arguing with one who has had but a taste of its blessedness and saying to him how can these things be it is not the least use starting all sorts of difficulties and theoretical suppositions about it with such a one any more than it was when the jews argued with the man who said one thing i know that whereas i was blind now i see the lord jesus does take the life that is offered to him and he does keep that life for himself that is entrusted to him but until the life is offered we cannot know the taking and until the life is entrusted we cannot know or understand the keeping all we can do is to say o oh, taste and see and bear witness to the reality of jesus christ and set our seal that we have found him true to his every word and that we have proved him able even to do exceeding abundantly above all we asked or thought why should we hesitate to bear this testimony we have done nothing at all we have in all our efforts only proved to ourselves and perhaps to others that we had no power either to give or keep our lives why should we not then glorify his grace by acknowledging that we have found him so wonderfully and tenderly gracious and faithful in both taking and keeping as we never supposed or imagined i shall never forget the smile and emphasis with which a poor working man bore this witness to his lord i said to him well h we have a good master have we not ah said he a deal better than ever i thought that summed up his experience and so it will sum up the experience of every one who will but yield their lives wholly to the same good master i cannot close this chapter without a word with those especially my younger friends 
who although they have named the name of christ are saying yes this is all very well for some people or for older people but i am not ready for it i can't say i see my way to this sort of thing i am going to take the lowest ground for a minute and appeal to your past experience are you satisfied with your experience of the other sort of thing your pleasant pursuits your harmless recreations your nice occupations even your improving ones what fruit are you having from them your social intercourse your daily talks and walks your investments of all the time that remains to you over and above the absolute duties god may have given you what fruit that shall remain have you from all this day after day passes on and year after year and what shall the harvest be what is even the present return are you getting any real and lasting satisfaction out of it all are you not finding that things lose their flavor and that you are spending your strength day after day for naught that you are no more satisfied than you were a year ago rather less so if anything does not a sense of hollowness and weariness come over you as you go on in the same round perpetually getting through things only to begin again it cannot be otherwise over even the freshest and purest earthly fountains the hand that never makes a mistake has written he that drinketh of this water shall thirst again look into your own heart and you will find a copy of that inscription already traced shall thirst again and the characters are being deepened with every attempt to quench the inevitable thirst and weariness in life which can only be satisfied and rested in full consecration to god for thou hast made us for thyself and the heart never resteth till it findeth rest in thee to-day i tell you of a brighter and happier life whose inscription is shall never thirst a life that is no dull round and round in a circle of unsatisfactorinesses but a life that has found its true and entirely satisfactory centre and set itself towards a shining and entirely satisfactory goal whose brightness is cast over every step of the way will you not seek it do not shrink and suspect and hang back from what it may involve with selfish and unconfiding and ungenerous half-heartedness take the word of any who have willingly offered themselves unto the lord that the life of consecration is a deal better than any thought choose this day whom you will serve with real thorough-going whole-hearted service and he will receive you and you will find as we have found that he is such a good master that you are satisfied with his goodness and that you will never want to go out free nay rather take his own word for it see what he says if they obey and serve him they shall spend their days in prosperity and their years in pleasures you cannot possibly understand that till you are really in his service for he does not give nor ever show his wages before you enter it and he says my servants shall sing for joy of heart but you cannot try over that song to see what it is like you cannot even read one bar of it till your nominal or even promised service is exchanged for real and undivided consecration but when he can call you my servant then you will find yourself singing for joy of heart because he says you shall and who then is willing to consecrate his service this day unto the lord do not startle at the term or think because you do not understand all it may include you are therefore not qualified for it i dare say it comprehends a great deal more than either you or i understand but we can both enter into the spirit of it and the detail will unfold itself as long as our probation shall last christ demands a hearty consecration in will and he will teach us what that involves in act this explains the paradox that full consecration may be in one sense the act of a moment and in another the work of a lifetime it must be complete to be real and yet if real it is always incomplete a point of rest and yet a perpetual progression suppose you make over a piece of ground to another person you give it up then and there entirely to that other it is no longer in your own possession you no longer dig and sow plant and reap 
at your discretion or for your own profit his occupation of it is total no other has any right to an inch of it it is his affair thenceforth what crop to arrange for and how to make the most of it but his practical occupation of it may not appear all at once there may be wasteland which he will take into full cultivation only by degrees space wasted for want of draining or by overfencing and odd corners lost for want of enclosing fields yielding smaller returns than they might because of hedgerows too wide and shady and trees too many and spreading and strips of good soil trampled into uselessness for want of defined pathways just so it is with our lives the transaction of so to speak making them over to god is definite and complete but then begins the practical development of consecration and here he leads on softly according as the children be able to endure i do not suppose any one sees anything like all that it involves at the outset we have not a notion what an amount of waste or power there has been in our lives we never measured out the odd corners and the undrained bits and it never occurred to us what good fruit might be growing in our straggling hedgerows nor how the shade of our trees has been keeping the sun from the scanty crops and so season by season we shall be sometimes not a little startled yet always very glad as we find that bit by bit the master shows how much more may be made of our ground how much more he is able to make of it than we did and we shall be willing to work under him and do exactly what he points out even if it comes to cutting down a shady tree or clearing out a ditch full of pretty weeds and wild flowers as the seasons pass on it will seem as if there was always more and more to be done the very fact that he is constantly showing us something more to be done in it proving that it is really his ground only let him have the ground no matter how poor or overgrown the soil may be and then he will make her wilderness like eden and her desert like the garden of the lord yes even our desert and then we shall sing my beloved has gone down into his garden to the beds of spices to feed in the gardens and to gather lilies made for thyself o god made for thy love thy service thy delight made to show forth thy wisdom grace and might made for thy praise whom veiled archangels laud o strange and glorious thought that we may be a joy to thee yet the heart turns away from this grand destiny of bliss and deems twas made for its poor self for passing dreams chasing illusions melting day by day till for ourselves we read in this world's best this is not rest chapter two of kept for the master's use this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Fiddlesticks. Kept for the Master's Use by Francis Ridley Havergal. Chapter 2. Our Moments Kept for Jesus. Keep my moments and my days. Let them flow in ceaseless praise. It may be a little help to writer and reader if we consider some of the practical details of the life which we desire to have kept for Jesus in the order of the little hymn at the beginning of this book, with the one word, take, changed to keep. So we will take a couplet for each chapter. The first point that naturally comes up is that which is almost synonymous with life, our time and this brings us at once face to face with one of our past difficulties and its probable cause when we take a wide sweep we are so apt to be vague when we are aiming at generalities we do not hit the practicalities we forget that faithfulness to principle is only proved by faithfulness in detail has not this vagueness had something to do with the constant ineffectiveness of our feeble desire that our time should be devoted to god in things spiritual the greater does not always include the less but paradoxically the less more often includes the greater so in this case time is entrusted to us to be traded with for our lord but we cannot grasp it as a whole we instinctively break it up ere we can deal with it for any purpose 
so when a new year comes round we commit it with special earnestness to the lord but as we do so are we not conscious of a feeling that even a year is too much for us to deal with and does not this feeling that we are dealing with a larger thing than we can grasp take away from the sense of reality thus we are brought to a more manageable measure and as the sunday mornings or the monday mornings come round we thankfully commit the opening week to him and the sense of help and rest is renewed and strengthened but not even the six or seven days are close enough to our hand even to-morrow exceeds our tiny grasp and even to-morrow's grace is therefore not given to us so we find the need of considering our lives as a matter of day by day and that any more general committal and consecration of our time does not meet the case so truly here we have found much comfort and help and if results have not been entirely satisfactory they have at least been more so than before we reached this point of subdivision but if we have found help and blessing by going a certain distance in one direction is it not probable we shall find more if we go further in the same and so if we may commit the days to our lord why not the hours and why not the moments and may we not expect a fresh and special blessing in so doing we do not realize the importance of moments only let us consider these two sayings of god about them in a moment shall they die and we shall all be changed in a moment and we shall think less lightly of them eternal issues may hang upon any one of them but it has come and gone before we can even think about it nothing seems less within the possibility of our own keeping yet nothing is more inclusive of all other keeping therefore let us ask him to keep them for us are they not the tiny joints in the harness through which the darts of temptation pierce us only give us time we think and we should not be overcome only give us time and we could pray and resist and the devil would flee from us but he comes all in a moment and in a moment an unguarded unkept one we utter the hasty or exaggerated word or think the unchristlike thought or feel the unchristlike impatience or resentment but even if we have gone so far as to say take my moments have we gone the step further and really let him take them really entrusted them to him it is no good saying take when we do not let go how can another keep that which we are keeping hold of so let us with full trust in his power first commit these slippery moments to him put them right into his hand and then we may trustfully and happily say lord keep them for me keep every one of the quick series as it arises i cannot keep them for thee do thou keep them for thyself but the sanctified and christ-loving heart cannot be satisfied with only negative keeping we do not want only to be kept from displeasing him but to be kept always pleasing him every kept from should have its corresponding and still more blessed kept for we do not want our moments to be simply kept from satan's use but to be kept for his use we want them to be not only kept from sin but kept for his praise do you ask but what use can he make of mere moments i will not stay to prove or illustrate the obvious truth that as are the moments so will be the hours and the days which they build you understand that well enough i will answer your question as it stands look back through the history of the church in all ages and mark how often a great work and mighty influence grew out of a mere moment in the life of one of god's servants a mere moment but overshadowed and filled with the fruitful power of the holy spirit of god the moment may have been spent in uttering five words but they have fed five thousand or even five hundred thousand or it may have been lit by the flash of a thought that has shone into hearts and homes throughout the land and kindled torches that have been borne into earth's darkest corners the rapid speaker or the lonely thinker little guessed what use his lord was making of that single moment there was no room in it for even a thought of that if that moment had not been though perhaps unconsciously kept for jesus but had been otherwise occupied what a harvest to his praise would have been missed the same thing is going on every day it is generally a moment either an opening or a culminating one that really does the work it is not so often a whole sermon as a single short sentence in it that wings god's arrow to a heart 
it is seldom a whole conversation that is the means of bringing out the desired result but some sudden turn of thought or word which comes with the electric touch of god's power sometimes it is less than that only a look and what is more momentary has been used by him for the pulling down of strongholds again in our own quiet waiting upon god as moment after moment glides past in the silence at his feet the eye resting upon a page of his word or only looking up to him through the darkness have we not found that he can so irradiate one passing moment with his light that its rays never die away but shine on and on through days and years are not such moments proved to have been kept for him and if some why not all this view of moments seems to make it clearer that it is impossible to serve two masters for it is evident that the service of a moment cannot be divided if it is occupied in the service of self or any other master it is not at the lord's disposal how can he make use of what is already occupied oh how much we have missed by not placing them at his disposal what might he not have done with the moments freighted with self or loaded with emptiness which we have carelessly let drift by oh what might have been if they had all been kept for jesus how he might have filled them with his light and life enriching our own lives that have been impoverished by the waste and using them in far-spreading blessing and power while we have been undervaluing these fractions of eternity what has our gracious god been doing in them how strangely touching are the words what is man that thou shouldest set thine heart upon him and that thou shouldest visit him every morning and try him every moment terribly solemn and awful would be the thought that he has been trying us every moment were it not for the yearning gentleness and love of the father revealed in that wonderful expression of wonder what is man that thou shouldest set thine heart upon him think of that ceaseless setting of his heart upon us careless and forgetful children as we have been and think of those other words none the less literally true because given under a figure i the lord do keep it i will water it every moment we see something of god's infinite greatness and wisdom when we try to fix our dazzled gaze on infinite space but when we turn to the marvels of the microscope we gain a clearer view and more definite grasp of these attributes by gazing on the perfection of his infinitesimal handiworks just so while we cannot realize the infinite love which fills eternity and the infinite vistas of the great future are dark with excess of light even to the strongest telescopes of faith we see that love magnified in the microscope of the moments brought very close to us and revealing its unspeakable perfection of detail to our wondering sight but we do not see this as long as the moments are kept in our own hands we are like little children closing our fingers over diamonds how can they receive and reflect the rays of light analyzing them into all the splendor of their prismatic beauty while they are kept shut up tight in the dirty little hands give them up let our father hold them for us and throw his own great light upon them and then we shall see them full of fair colors of his manifold loving-kindness and let him always keep them for us then we shall always see his light and his love reflected in them and then surely they shall be filled with praise not that we are to be always singing hymns and using the expressions of other people's praise any more than the saints in glory are always literally singing a new song but praise will be the tone the color the atmosphere in which they flow none of them away from it or out of it is it a little too much for them all to flow in ceaseless praise well where will you stop what proportion of your moments do you think enough for jesus how many for the spirit of praise and how many for the spirit of heaviness be explicit about it and come to an understanding if he is not to have all then how much calculate balance and apportion you will not be able to do this in heaven you know it will be all praise there but you are free to have your service of praise here or to make the proportion what you will yet he made you for glory yet he chose you that you should be to the praise of his glory he loves you every moment waters you every moment watches you unslumberingly cares for you unceasingly yet he died for you dear friends one can hardly write it without tears 
shall you or i remember all this love and hesitate to give all our moments up to him let us entrust him with them and ask him to keep them all every single one for his own beloved self and fill them all with his praise and let them all be to his praise chapter three of kept for the master's use this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by esther ben simonides kept for the master's use by francis ridley havergal chapter three our hands kept for jesus keep my hands that they may move at the impulse of thy love when the lord has said to us is thine heart right as my heart is with thy heart the next word seems to be if it be give me thine hand what a call to confidence and love and free loyal happy service is this and how different will the result of its acceptance be from the old lamentation we labor and have no rest we have given the hand to the egyptians and to the assyrians in the service of these other lords under whatever shape they have presented themselves we shall have known something of the meaning of having both the hands full with travail and vexation of spirit how many a thing have we taken in hand as we say which we expected to find an agreeable task an interest in life a something towards filling up that unconfessed aching void which is often most real when least acknowledged and after a while we have found it changed under our hands into irksome travail involving perpetual vexation of spirit the thing may have been of the earth and for the world and then no wonder it failed to satisfy even the instinct of work which comes natural to many of us or it may have been right enough in itself something for the good of others so far as we understood their good and unselfish and all but unravelled motive and yet we found it full of tangled vexations because the hands that held it were not simply consecrated to god well if so let us bring these soiled and tangle making hands to the lord let us lift up our heart with our hands to him asking him to clear and cleanse them if he says what is that in thine hand let us examine honestly whether it is something which he can use for his glory or not if not do not let us hesitate an instant about dropping it, it maybe something we do not like to part with but the lord is able to give thee much more than this and the first glimpse of the excellency of the knowledge of christ jesus your lord will enable us to count those things lost which were gained to us but if it is something which he can use he will make us do ever so much more with it than before moses little thought what the lord was going to make him do with that rod in his hand the first thing he had to do with it was to cast it on the ground and see it pass through a startling change after this he was commanded to take it up again hard and terrifying as it was to do so but when it became a rod again in his hand it was no longer what it was before the simple rod of a wandering desert shepherd henceforth it was the rod of god in his hand exodus four twenty wherewith he should do signs and by which god himself would do marvellous things psalm seventy eight twelve if we look at any old testament about consecration we shall see that marginal reading of it the word is fill the hand example exodus twenty eight forty one first chronicles twenty nine five now if our hands are full of other things they cannot be filled with the things that are jesus christ there must be emptying before there can be any true filling so if we are sorrowfully seeing that our hands have not been kept for jesus let us humbly begin at the beginning and ask him to empty them thoroughly that he may fill them completely for they must be emptied either we come to our lord willingly about it letting him unclasp their hold and gladly dropping the glittering weights they have been carrying or in very love he will have to force them open and wrench from the reluctant grasp the earthly things which are so occupying them that he cannot have his rightful use of them there is only one other alternative a terrible one to be led alone till the day comes when not a gentle master but the relentless king of terrors shall empty the trembling hands as our feet follow him out of the busy world into the dark valley for it is certain we can carry nothing out yet the emptying and the filling are not all that has to be considered before the hands of the priest could be filled with the emblems of consecration they had to be laid upon the emblem of atonement levi eight fourteen etc that came first aaron and his sons laid their hands upon the head of the bullock for the sin offering so the transference of guilt to our substitute typified by that act must precede the dedication of ourselves to god my faith would lay her hand on that dear head of thine where like a penitent i stand and there confess my sin 
the blood of that holy substitute was shed to make reconciliation upon the altar without that reconciliation we cannot offer and present ourselves to god but this being made christ himself presents us and you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight then moses brought the ram for the burnt offering and aaron and his sons laid their hands upon the head of the ram and moses burnt the whole ram upon the altar it was a burnt offering for a sweet savour and an offering made by fire unto the lord thus christ's offering was indeed a whole one body soul and spirit each and all suffering even unto death these atoning sufferings accepted by god for us are by our own free act accepted by us as the ground of our acceptance then reconciled and accepted we are ready for consecration for then he brought the other ram the ram of consecration and aaron and his sons laid their hands upon the head of the ram here we see christ who is consecrated for evermore we enter by faith into union with him who said for their sakes i sanctify myself that they also might be sanctified through the truth after all this their hands were filled with consecrations for a sweet savour so after laying the hand of our faith upon christ suffering and dying for us we are to lay that very same hand of faith and in the very same way upon him as consecrated for us to be the source of life and power of our consecration and then our hands shall be filled with consecrations filled with christ and filled with all that is a sweet savour to god in him and who then is willing to fill his hand this day unto the lord do you want an added motive listen again fill your hands to-day to the lord that he may bestow upon you a blessing this day not a long time hence not even to-morrow but this day do you not want a blessing is not your answer to your father's what wilt thou the same as acts says give me a blessing here is his promise of just what you so want will you not gladly fulfil his condition a blessing shall immediately follow he does not specify what it shall be he waits to reveal it you will find it such a blessing as you would not suppose could be for you a blessing that shall verily make you rich with no sorrow added a blessing this day all that has been said about consecration applies to our literal members stay a minute and look at your hand the hand that holds this little book as you read it see how wonderfully it is made how perfectly fitted for what it has to do how ingeniously connected with the brain so as to yield the instantaneous and instinctive obedience without which its beautiful mechanism would be very little good to us your hand do you say whether it is soft and fair with an easy life or rough and strong with a working one or white and weak with illness it is the lord jesus christ it is not your own at all it belongs to him he made it for without him was not anything made that was made not even your hand and he has the added right of purchase he has bought it that it might be one of his own instruments we know this very well but have we realized it have we really let him make the use of our hands his and have we ever simply and sincerely asked him to keep them for his own use does this mean that we are always to be doing some definitely religious work as it is called no but that all that we do is to be always definitely done for him there is a great difference if the hands are indeed moving at the impulse of his love the simplest little duties and acts are transfigured into holy service to the lord a servant with this clause makes drudgery divine who sweeps a room as for thy laws makes that and the action fine george herbert a christian school girl loves jesus she wants to please him all day long and so she practices her skills carefully and conscientiously it is at the impulse of his love that her fingers move so steadily through the otherwise tiresome exercises some day her master will find a use for her music but meanwhile it may be just as really done unto him as if it were mr sankey at his organ swaying the hearts of thousands the hand of a christian lad traces his latin verses or his figures or his copying he is doing his best because a banner has been given him that it may be displayed not so much by talk as by continuance and well-doing and so for jesus sake his hand moves accurately and perseveringly a busy wife or daughter or servant has a number of little manual duties to perform if these are done slowly and leisurely they may be got through but there will not be time left for some little service to the poor or some little kindness to a suffering or troubled neighbour or for a little quiet time alone with god and his word and so the hands move quickly impelled by the loving desire for service or communion kept in busy motion for jesus sake or it may be that the special aim is to give no occasion of reproach to some who are watching but so to adorn the doctrine that those may be won by the life will not be bound by the word then the hands will have their share to do 
they will move carefully neatly perhaps even elegantly making everything around as nice as possible letting their intelligent touch be seen in the details of the home and even of the dress doing or arranging all the little things decently and in order for jesus sake and so on with every duty and every position it may seem an odd idea but a simple glance at one's hand and the recollection these hand is not mine it has been given to jesus and it must be kept for jesus may sometimes turn the scale in a doubtful manner and be a safeguard from certain temptations with that thought fresh in your mind as you look in your hand can you let it take up things which to say the very least are not for jesus things which evidently cannot be used as they are most certainly are not used either for him or by him cards for instance can you deliberately hold in it books of a kind which you know perfectly well by sadly repeated experience lead you farther from instead of nearer to him books which must and do fill your mind with those other things which entering in choke the word books which you would not care to read at all if your heart were burning within you at the coming of his feet to bless you next time any temptation of this sort approaches just look at your hand it was of a literal hand that our lord jesus spoke when he said behold the hand of him that betrayeth me is with me on the tail and he that dippeth his hand with me in the dish the same shall betray me a hand so near to jesus with him on the table touching his own hand in the dish at that hour of sweetest and closest and most solemn intercourse and yet betraying him that same hand taking thirty pieces of silver what a tremendous lesson of the need of keeping for our hands oh that every hand that is with him at his sacramental table and that takes the memorial bread may be kept from any faithless and loveless motion and again it was by literal wicked hands that our lord jesus was crucified and slain does not the thought that human hands have been so treacherous and cruel to our beloved lord make us wish the more fervently that our hands may be totally faithful and devoted to him danger and temptation to let the hands move at other impulses is every bit as great to those who have nothing else to do but to render direct service and who think they are doing nothing else take one practical instance our letter writing have we not been tempted and fallen before the temptation according to our various dispositions to let the hand that holds the pen move with the impulse to write an unkind thought of another to say a clever or sarcastic thing or a slightly coloured and exaggerated thing which will make our point more telling or to let out a grumbler suspicion or to let the pen run away with us into flippant and trifling words unworthy of our high and holy calling have we not drifted away from the golden reminder should he reason with unprofitable talk and with speeches wherewith he can do no good why has this been perhaps again and again is it not for want of putting our hands into our dear master's hand and asking and trusting him to keep with them he could have kept he would have kept whatever our work or our special temptations may be the principle remains the same only let us apply it for ourselves perhaps one hardly need to say that the kept hands will be very gentle hands quick angry motions of the heart will sometimes force themselves into expression by the hand though the tongue may be restrained the very way in which we close a door or lay down a book may be a victory or a defeat a witness to christ's keeping or a witness that we are not being truly kept how can we expect that god will use this member as an instrument of righteousness unto him if we yield it thus as an instrument of unrighteousness unto sin therefore let us see to it that it is at once yielded to him whose right it is and let our sorrow that it should have been even for an instant desecrated to satan's use lead us to entrust it henceforth to our lord to be kept by the power of god through faith for the master's use for when the gentleness of christ dwells in us he can use the merest touch of a finger have we not heard of one gentle touch on a wayward shoulder being the turning point of a life i have known a case in which the master made use of less than that only the quiver of a little finger being made the means of touching a wayward heart what must the touch of the master's own hand have been one imagines it very gentle though so full of power can he not communicate both the power and the gentleness when he touched the hand of peter's wife's mother she arose and ministered unto them do you not think the hand which jesus had just touched must have ministered very excellently as we ask him to touch our lips with living fire so that they may speak effectively for him may we not ask him to touch our hands that they may minister effectively and excel in all that they find to do for him then our hands shall be made strong by the hands of the mighty god of jacob it is very pleasant to feel that if our hands are indeed our lord's we may ask him to guide them and strengthen them and teach them i do not mean figuratively but quite literally and everything they do for him and that should be everything we ever undertake we want to do it well better and better seek that ye may excel 
we are too apt to think that he has given us certain natural gifts but has nothing practically to do with the improvement of them and leaves us to ourselves for that why not ask him to make these hands of ours more handy for his service more skilful in what is indicated as the next thing they are to do the kept hands need not be clumsy hands if the lord taught david's hands to war and his fingers to fight will he not teach our hands and fingers too to do what he would have them do the spirit of god must have taught bezalel's hands as well as his head for he is filled with it not only that he might devise cunning works but also in cutting of stones and carving of timber and when all the women that were wise-hearted did spin with their hands the hands must have been skilful as well as the hearts wise to prepare the beautiful garments and curtains there is a very remarkable instance of the hand of the lord which i suppose signifies that in case of the power of his spirit being upon the hand of a man in first chronicle twenty eight nineteen we read all this said david the lord made me understand in writing by his hand upon me even all the works of this pattern this cannot well mean that the lord gave david a miraculously written scroll because a few verses before it says that he had it all by the spirit so what else can it mean but that as david wrote the hand of the lord was upon his hand impelling him to trace letter by letter the right words of description for all the details of the temple that solomon should build with its courts and chambers its treasuries and vessels have we not sometimes sat down to write feeling perplexed and ignorant and wishing someone were there to tell us what to say at such a moment were a mere note for post or a sheet for press it is a great comfort to recollect this mighty laying of divine hand upon a human one and ask for the same help from the same lord it is sure to be given and now dear friend what about your own hands are they consecrated to the lord who loves you and if they are are you trusting him to keep them and enjoying all that is involved in that keeping do let this be settled with your master before you go on to the next chapter after all this question will hinge on another do you love him if you really do there can surely be neither hesitation about yielding them to him nor about entrusting them to him to be kept does he love you that is a truer way of putting it for it is not our love to christ but the love of christ to us which constraineth us and this is the impulse of the motion and the mode of the keeping the steam engine does not move when the fire is not kindled nor when it has gone out no matter how complete the machinery and abundant the fuel cold coals will neither set it going nor keep it working let us ask him so to shed abroad his love in our hearts by the holy ghost which is given unto us that it may be the perpetual and only impulse of every action of our daily life chapter four of kept for the master's use this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by bria snow kept for the master's use by francis ridley havergal chapter four our feet kept for jesus keep my feet that they may be swift and beautiful for thee the figurative keeping of the feet of his saints with the promise that when they run they shall not stumble is a most beautiful and helpful subject but it is quite distinct from the literal keeping for jesus of our literal feet there is a certain homeliness about the idea which helps to make it very real these very feet of ours are purchased for christ's service by the precious drops which fell from his own torn and pierced feet upon the cross they are to be his errand runners how can we let the world the flesh and the devil have the use of what has been purchased with such payment shall the world have the use of them shall they carry us where the world is paramount and the master cannot be even named because the mention of his name would be so obviously out of place i know the apparent difficulties of a subject which will at once occur in connection with this but they all vanish when our bright banner is loyally unfurled with its motto all for jesus do you honestly want your very feet to be kept for jesus let these simple words kept for jesus ring out next time the dancing difficulty or any other difficulty of the same kind comes up and i know what the result will be shall the flesh have the use of them shall they carry us hither and thither merely because we like to go merely because it pleases ourselves to take this walk or to pay this visit and after all what a failure it is 
if people only would believe it self-pleasing is always a failure in the end our good master gives us a reality and fullness of pleasure in pleasing him which we never get out of pleasing ourselves shall the devil have the use of them oh no of course not we start back at this as a highly unnecessary question yet if jesus has not satan has for as all are serving either the prince of life or the prince of this world and as no man can serve two masters it follows that if we are not serving the one we are serving the other satan is only too glad to disguise this service under the less startling form of the world or the still less startling one of self all that is not kept for jesus is left for self or the world and therefore for satan there is no fear but that our lord will have many uses for what is kept by him for himself how beautiful are the feet of them that bring glad tidings of good things that is the best use of all and i expect the angels think those feet beautiful even if they are cased in muddy boots or galoshes once the question was asked wherefore wilt thou run my son seeing thou hast no tidings ready so if we want to have these beautiful feet we must have the tidings ready which they are to bear let us ask him to keep our hearts so freshly full of his good news of salvation that our mouths may speak out of their abundance if the clouds be full of rain they empty themselves upon the earth the two olive branches empty the golden oil out of themselves may we be so filled with the spirit that we may thus have much to pour out for others besides the great privilege of carrying water from the wells of salvation there are plenty of cups of cold water to be carried in all directions not to the poor only ministries of love are often as much needed by a rich friend but the feet must be kept for these they will be too tired for them if they are tired out for self-pleasing in such services we are treading in the blessed steps of his most holy life who went about doing good then there is literal errand going just to fetch something that is needed for the household or something that a tired relative wants whether asked or unasked such things should come first instead of last because these are clearly indicated as our lord's will for us to do by the position in which he has placed us that while what seems more direct service may be after all not so directly apportioned by him i have to go and buy some soap said one with a little sigh the sigh was waste of breath for her feet were going to do her lord's will for that next half hour much more truly than if they had carried her to a well-worked district and left the soap to take its chance a member of the young woman's christian association wrote a few words on this subject which i think will be welcome to many more than she expected them to reach Quote, may it not be a comfort to those of us who feel we have not the mental or spiritual power that others have to notice the living sacrifice mentioned in romans twelve one is our bodies of course that includes the mental power but does it not also include the loving sympathizing glance the kind encouraging word the ready errand for another the work of our hands opportunities for all of which come oftener in the day than for the mental power we are often tempted to envy may we be enabled to offer willingly that which we have for if there be first a willing mind it is accepted according to that a man hath and not according to that he hath not End quote. if our feet are to be kept at his disposal our eyes must be ever toward the lord for guidance we must look to him for our orders where to go then he will be sure to give them the steps of a good man are ordered by the lord very often we find that they have been so literally ordered for us that we are quite astonished just as if he had not promised do not smile at a very homely thought if our feet are not our own ought we not to take care of them for him 
whose they are. Is it quite right to be reckless about getting wet feet, which might be guarded against either by forethought or afterthought, when there is, at least, a risk of hindering our service thereby? Does it please the Master, when, even in our zeal for His work, we annoy anxious friends by carelessness in little things of this kind? May every step of our feet be more and more like those of our beloved Master. Let us continually consider Him in this, and go where He would have gone, on the errand which He would have done, following hard after Him. And let us look on to the time when our feet shall stand in the gates of the heavenly Jerusalem, when holy feet shall tread the streets of the holy city, no longer pacing any lonely path, for he hath said, They shall walk with me in white. And he hath said, How beautiful the feet, the feet so weary, travel-stained, and worn, the feet that humbly, patiently have borne the toilsome way, the pressure, and the heat, the feet not hasting on with winged might, nor strong to trample down the opposing foe, so lowly, so human, they must go, by painful steps to scale the mountain height. Not unto all the tuneful lips are given, the ready tongue, the words so strong and sweet, yet all may turn with humble, willing feet, and bear to darkened souls the light from heaven. And fall they while the goal far distant lies, with scarce a word yet spoken for their Lord, his sweet approval he doth yet accord, their feet are beauteous in the master's eyes. With weary human feet he day by day once trod this earth to work his acts of love, and every step is chronicled above his servants take to follow in his way. Sarah Geraldina Stock, 